Let's continue with our arteries and go then to the vertebral arteries. So why vertebral? If we have our heart with our ascending, let's do it in red while we've got it. Ascending aorta coming out into the subclavian here after the arch, our brachiocephalic, and then our subclavian. The first branch coming off here is what? Pardon? Common carotid, right. So that's common carotid. So you go one beyond the common carotid on the subclavian, and you'll come to the vertebral. So our second one is our vertebral. It has an unusual pathway as it goes up the neck to the brain. It will go through, let's put in, this will be our skull, our, and our destination is this big foramen here. What do we call it? Foramen magnum. Good. Foramen magnum. And then we have the cervical vertebra. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do I put an eighth one? No. All right. And their transverse processes. Remember the transverse processes on the vertebra? Little ones up here. These are transverse. processes. So here we have these vertebral arteries coming off, and they will go through foramen in the transverse processes as they go up to the foramen magnum. Now who can tell me why we have that kind of adaptation? These would be vertebral arteries. These are all our cervical vertebra. Rather an interesting arrangement. Just twist your head like this, like you do all day long. Why do you think those vessels are within those processes? It must be advantageous. I'll leave that to your imagination, and sometime you'll tell me. All right? Let's continue on, then, with the subclavian. The subclavian, then, will come around. And as it comes to the axilla, it's going to change its name to the axillary artery. As it goes down to the arm, what are you going to call it there? The brachial artery. And how many have had their blood pressure taken? <laughs> Got some hands. So that's just where you take your blood pressure on the brachial artery. And just about a centimeter below the elbow, the brachial artery branches into the radial and ulnar arteries.
So this will be about one centimeter below elbow. And we'll have then which is going to be on the outside and which on the medial side, which is on the lateral side, radial artery, ulnar, and then at the hand we'll have the palmar arch and the digitals. Palmar. arch and digitals in the fingers and thumb. So that gives roughly, where do we take our pulse? We take it distal, where? Yes. So X equals area to take pulse. distal radial. Do you take it with your thumb or with your fingers? With your fingers, of course. So let's now follow the descending aorta. Let's start at the top of a page because I want to go clear down to the leg if possible. So we have our arch and then we have the descending aorta. And we know where the diaphragm is now, as long as our heart is there, because we know the pericardium will attach to the diaphragm. We can start putting things together now as we get more systems. So this will uh, give us the thoracic aorta here. And inferior to the diaphragm, we'll have the abdominal aorta. All part of the descending aorta. And within the thoracic, we have the esophageal artery coming off. We have the intercostals. And we have the bronchioles. So this will be esophageal. And you know how the esophagus is passing through this area. We had it in the mediastinum. And then we have the intercostals to get all the muscles between the costal cartilages and ribs. And then we have the, the bronchial arteries going where? Pardon? Lung, sure. So now we come down to the abdominal aorta. And at the abdominal aorta, we have many vessels coming off. Some are paired and some are not paired. room for them over there. Well, we'll put them here. We have, these are the uh, abdominal We'll have first the unpaired which will be the celiac celiac and the celiac will be supplying blood to your liver, very rich in blood, to your stomach, to your spleen, all 
also rich in blood, to pancreas, as examples. So many of your abdominal organs. So the celiac will be the, the first to come off here. Then the second coming off that's unpaired will be the superior mesentery. Superior mesentery. So it will supply the small intestine and part of the large intestine Large intestine we call the colon, and so we'll have a colon form sort of a picture frame around your abdominal wall. You have an ascending, transverse, descending colon. So if we put in our colon like this, as it's ascending, then it goes across the abdominal cavity, then it goes down, then it comes over so it can get to the rectum. So the part that the superior mesentery will be the up to half of the transverse colon. This will be supplied by superior mesentery. And we'll put our superior mesentery in here. And our next one is the inferior mesentery. What to use? inferior mesentery. And it will supply the rest of the intestine and the rectum. Rest of large intestine. And rectum. So this, if you're going to be an abdominal surgeon, like we had speaking to us the other day, if they have to take out part of the colon because of cancer, whether they take out part of the transverse, or we had an automobile accident reported and they had crushed the whole transverse, so they had seat belt going across there, right? So they had to sew the ascending to the descending. They have to know the blood supply when they're cutting these out. So number three, we're going to put it down a little further, leave space here. So these are your unpaired arteries off the abdominal. Now we have the paired arteries. The first paired will be the renal arteries to the kidney. So let's make it four will be the renal arteries. As their name applies, renal is kidney, so we know where they're going. And the vascular surgeon will be alluding to these when he comes, so be, re be sure that you keep these orders in place. He'll be talking about the renals, how they use them for landmarks. So here's my renal coming off here. And my next one will be the gonadal arteries. Gonadal arteries. We have the ovarian arteries. 
going to the ovaries and the testicular arteries going to the testes and so whether it's male or female we just call it gonadal here it will be coming they will be coming off as paired arteries take this a little longer five for gonadal so you can see if this is going to the testis, the gonadal is going to be long, the testicular artery to go all the way to the testis versus just to the pelvic cavity if it's the ovarian artery. So that gives us the branches off of our abdominal aorta. You'll see some pictures in 131A where they'll have um, an aneurysm of the abdominal aorta usually occurs below the renals. And Normally, a one-inch aorta will be swollen to five inches. And they can see it when you lie down, it pulses out here. Phenomenal what this artery can take and then be mended. So at uh, L4, the abdominal aorta divides into a common iliac, into the two common iliacs. This is a common iliac. So you can feel where L4 is roughly. Where's it going to be? Right about there. So you can transfer that around to see where you're getting the division of your abdominal aorta. And the common iliac will go into an internal iliac and an external iliac. This is internal iliac. And it will be going to the pelvic organs. And the external iliac, external iliac, will go into become the femoral artery, becomes femoral artery. What landmark do you think it becomes the femoral artery? What do you have coming from here to here at this region of the groin? The inguinal ligament. So we've learned that the femoral artery is on the inferior part of the inguinal ligament. So from here on, this is going to be femoral artery. Now the femoral artery will go down the thigh and at the posterior aspect of the knee, Going down by posterior knee. It'll be called the popliteal, popliteal artery. You know what popliteal means? It's not going to help you any. It means ham. <laughs> well, if they're calling these ham strings, they call the artery down there popliteal. I didn't name them. I'm just telling you why it gets such funny names. Then we go on down. That's posterior knee. And then we're going to divide into an anterior tibial and a posterior tibial. Anterior tibial, posterior tibial on the other side. and so forth, and you'll get your types of arches. They're similar, but not identical, and on down to your toes. 
but I think why I want to be sure that you know the anterior tibial. How many have ever had surgery where you're out for quite some time? One, only two. If they want to be sure that the feet are getting blood supply after a long, prolonged hours and hours of surgery, they take the pulse on the distal anterior tibial to be certain circulation is adequate. after surgery. Do you remember them doing that? No. <laughs> All right, so that gives you a bird's eye view of your arteries. Obviously, there are many, many, many more than we have time to give in this class. So let's turn to veins then. and. Veins are not quite as regularly arranged as arteries, nor are their coats as regular. Veins have three coats, too. And we can say how they differ from arteries. We're not going to go into all of them. One, they're thinner. They have a larger lumen. And what's another characteristic of veins that you don't find in arteries? They have valves. I mean, you've got this blood coming up from your legs. So in the extremities, the veins have valves. Have you ever tried to see your valves? Put your hands down. See, they really have to be down. It's kind of hard when you're sitting on the floor. <laughs> but if you're sitting there, and then see if they swell. In my body, I've got huge veins in my hand. So I can push out the blood and then let it come back in again. It's stopped by the, by the valve. You don't have such large veins, I'm sure, but <laughs> they're good for something. The students often come to office hours and they want to see it close. <laughs> see those veins, because you can see the valve is way up here. I've pushed out the blood. There's no blood in that valve. I don't know what you can see, but then it all comes back again, right? But it lets you know in the extremities you have valves. So, blood in veins is pushed along by contraction of our skeletal muscles. That's why we get up and walk after sitting in a plane for a long time. The legs begin to swell, so the skeletal muscles of the leg they help propel blood in veins. That's why you exercise. You want to keep strong, healthy muscles and strong, healthy veins. So where does all of the blood from the lower extremities and lower trunk collect to get into the heart? Inferior vena cava, sure. Where it is all the blood from the head and the upper extremities collect to get into the heart. Superior vena cava, simple little thing that you want to review every now and then to keep these in mind. Um, 
They, she's asking about the valves in the extremities. They look like semilunar valves. I've only seen them with two flaps. The ones I'll show you today for in the slides will just have two flaps, one on each side. All right? No, it's a good question. No, you don't want all the baggage that you have in the heart for a valve. You want a simple one that's going to go against the wall when the blood goes up, and when it tries to come back, it flaps back out. So what we want to look at now are the arrangements for getting blood out of the brain. So in the brain, Venous blood's going to go into veins, nothing unusual. But then it's going to go into venous sinuses, something new. Venous sinuses. And from venous sinuses, it's going to leave the brain and go into the internal jugular vein outside the skull. So what we want to discuss now is to introduce you to these important structures. What are venous sinuses? There are channels for venous blood in folds of dura of dura mater, folds, I put, for lack of a better term, dura mater. What is dura mater? What does it mean? What's dura? Hard. What's mater? Mother. Hard mother. <laughs> We can tell little stories about that because we have the pia mater, and what's the pia mater? Gentle mother. I was talking with little kids once, and they said, where's the mad mother? You know where they were coming from that day. <laughs> <laughs> so dura mater is sort of like a bathing cap. I mean, we've all seen bathing caps that hug the, the scalp when you go swimming. If you just take off the scalp and the hair and put one of those on the brain, you've got this cap of thick connective tissue. But it has many variations, too. So it's a thick CT covering over brain. So how do we put venous sinuses into this? Let's take what we call a coronal section of the head. Coronal section is cutting straight across this way. So this will be a coronal section of the head. And we'll put a brain in it. In its simplest form. So we'll have our dura mater. There are other membranes. I'm not going to put those in. I'm just going to give you the dura mater. So one layer of the dura mater is adherent to the inside of the skull. brain. equals dura mater. And there are actually two layers of dura mater here. But when we get to the midline, they separate.
these two are closely adhered. And here is where we have formed a venous sinus. It's between the layers of dura, right, coming across the top of your head. Part of this dura will come, come down between the hemispheres here. Later, we'll put in the other membranes. We're just doing the dura. And this sinus that we've developed here with venous blood flowing between the dura is the superior longitudinal sinus. So let's take now a mid-sagittal cut right down the center of the head. And we'll have our superior sagittal or superior longitudinal sinus running up here in its fold of dura. And then we had the dura that was coming down here. So we have to put this coming down here. It's coming down. Let's see how we want it. Like this. So all of this is dura between the hemispheres. What's it look like? Look like a sickle that they use to cut the hay. Have your handle here, sharp edge. It's called a falx, which is sickle. A falx, sorry. F-A-L-X, Cerebri. And that's just the dura mater here. This is the Falk Cerebri here. In this view, cross size, and this is it in this manner. What do we see in the free edge here? We see the inferior longitudinal sinus. Blood flow is going in this direction for these. This is my inferior longitudinal sinus. All blood in the brain is, will be running into these sinuses eventually. When you study it carefully, you see what veins are leading into these. Inferior longitudinal sinus. So we're flowing back, and we're not going to give all of these, but we'll put in here the straight sinus, which will be connecting my superior with my inferior. This is the straight sinus. Ever heard of these before? Ever thought this is going on inside your skulls? Now we have what's called the tent of the cerebellum. Separating the cerebral hemispheres is a layer of dura separating the cerebellum. So we're going to put in this tentorium cerebelli here. You have to imagine that the cerebellum's underneath but just to give it its appropriate name here. This is called the tentorium. It's dura between cerebrum and cerebellum. Tentorium, a very useful landmark, cerebellum, very simple. And when these 
two sinuses here run together are straight and are superior. I'm doing this simply. It's actually more complex, but I'm doing it simply. Along the edge of the skull where the tentorium comes, we have what's called a trans, uh, transverse sinus. It's going to come out as a transverse sinus. Transverse sinus, all getting blood from the brain. You saw the picture of all the blood that was getting into the brain. And now it's going to come up here and make an S shape. Sigmoid sinus. Sigmoid. sinus, and this finally will go out through the jugular foramen, jugular foramen, jugular means neck, jugular foramen, and become the internal jugular vein that's going to go down to your superior vena cava internal jugular vein. So you can see how all this blood, you can picture it in your own head. So it's coming around sideways and then down and coming out. You can see when you get a concussion and you get a subdural hematoma, you know, two of my friends have just died from subturtle hematomas because they're elderly and they fell. So keep your bodies healthy so when you fall, you can... I see you sitting up straight now. <laughs> Anyhow, very serious things can happen, but you'll learn all that in your clinical neurology. But this gives you how the blood leaves the brain and goes back into circulation. There's one other sinus that I think you should know because it's an important one. I'm just going to put it in, in here like this. Because it's right on each side of the pituitary. So I'm going to put an X there, because I can't draw much in there. This is called the cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus. There are folds of dura on each side of the cella tersica. Cavernous sinus. So there'll be folds of dura lateral to cella tersica. So you know where we are now. Terribly important area. But for now, we'll just put it there so at least you've heard of it, where the cavernous sinus is. So it gives you an idea of the complexity of the blood supply leaving the brain going into these venous sinuses. So now let's just take a little bit by looking at veins at extremities, where we've shown you already that they have valves. I'm only going to take a few veins here. So veins of extremities. So let's just take upper, the median cubital vein. Who knows the median cubital vein? Where is your median cubital vein? It's right here in the anterior aspect of your elbow. It's the one that you use if you're going to give blood they withdraw blood from the median cubicle. This is anterior elbow. Withdraw blood.
and you get infusion of blood there, right? Have you ever had to have um, either blood or saline or anything injected into your body? They'll put it in the median. So infuse blood here. All right, just a few veins in the um, lower extremity. lower extremity. Let's just take two examples. Let's take the deep femoral. So you can imagine where it's going to be. You've seen the femoral artery in the thigh. This is going to be the deep vein in the thigh. And it can be subject to a condition called phlebitis. How many have ever heard of phlebitis? Nobody. Phlebitis is inflammation of the vein. So you can picture a vein's wall, because you know it has the three coats, just like the artery, but they're not as well formed. We'll show a picture in a moment. And in phlebitis, with the inflammation of the vein, clots are formed. For the leg gets painful. When do they frequently see phlebitis after surgery, and then you're immobile for weeks or so. Don't move. Phlebitis can occur. They can go in and tie off the deep femoral vein, and you have to set up all new, what we call collateral circulation. Terribly painful. If we have a deep vein, we have superficial vein. The superficial vein of the lower extremity, superficial vein, lower extremity, anybody know the name of it? It's the, thank you, longest vein in your body, the saphenous vein. Saphenous. Never heard of it. It's the longest vein in body. It's coming from the medial aspect of the arch of your foot. Can't read that very well, sorry. medial arch of foot. Where is it going to empty into the femoral vein? Where is your femoral vein on the surface? Oh, femoral triangle, right. <laughs> <laughs> said femoral triangle 20 times if I've said it once. All right, so it's going to enter femoral vein at femoral triangle. Remember femoral triangle, navel, N-A-V-E-L? What did our V stand for? Vein. <laughs> right. <laughs> review, review, review. Because this, when you go into the field, it's essential. So what do they use the saphenous vein for today? 
Anybody know anybody who's had bypass surgery? Yeah, lots of us. Professor Wake here had bypass surgery. Went down, cut out a piece of his saphenous vein. Use that to replace his carotid artery, his uh, coronary artery. Something to think about. Saphenous vein used for bypass surgery. Oh, are we finished? No, I, I'll do this, because I want you to appreciate this. Because somebody in um, bioengineering right now is trying to use stem cells to grow endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells to make artificial arteries, because you're putting a vein where an artery, let's look at a vein. Slides, please. See if you would like a vein being supplemented for your arteries. Here we are with the arteries we've just discussed. We have our internal, our common carotid and our external internal carotid. Well, they won't show the subclavian coming off here. I mean the um, vertebrals, but we'll just take this one. This is a subclavian coming down to the axillary around the armpit, the axilla, the brachial, then switch, branching into radial, ulnar, palmar arch, and digitals. And then we had the arteries from the descending aorta. They don't show the branches of the thoracic here, but they have a celiac. And they show the, uh, this would be the superior mesentery, the renals, the gonadals, the inferior mesentery. Coming down to the common iliac, the internal iliacs, the external iliacs could become femorals, popliteal, down to posterior tibial, anterior tibial, down to arches and digitals. Next one. Next one, please. Now, these are just cross sections with a uh, scanning EM to see blood vessels, beautiful, clear blood vessels. Next one. Next one, please. This is an outside of a scanning EM, and this is a pericyte. It's thought that pericytes pick up things that are leaking from blood vessels. The next slide will be a unique one that you won't find anywhere in the next slide. This is a blood vessel in an Alzheimer individual. These are the multiplication of pericytes, which tell us about leaky blood vessels in Alzheimer's. This is my husband's work at UCLA. And he showed this decades ago, and he told me yesterday, this has become fashionable now, that leaky blood vessels may play a big role in Alzheimer's. But you can see these parasites. In the next one. And then this is our descending aorta. It'll be giving off the intercostals. It won't show everything. Now we see the diaphragm coming down to the abdominal aorta with our celiac and our mesenteries, our renals coming off here. In the next one. Now, this is an artery. You've seen this. What kind of artery, elastic or muscular? Muscular. Bye. Good for you. Your internal elastic membrane, your muscle, and your connective tissue. Next one. What's that? Large lumen, thin wall. It's a vein. Would you like a vein substituting for an artery? You would if your coronaries blocked today's world. But hopefully that someday they'll have replaced arteries rather than using the saphenous vein. In the next one. And this is a vein. It's a larger one. This is smooth muscle, connective tissue. Next one. Now, this is a vein with valves. You asked about valves. These are endothelial flaps of connective tissue, and they're sort of like pockets on a coat. If I worn a coat today, you know, you have your pocket. When you want to go down, my hands are too dirty to put them in my pockets. <laughs> but the flap goes out. When the go blood goes by, the pocket goes sideways. You can see how that would work. So we have two flaps here in a vein. Next one. 
And this just shows the veins. They look pretty rich, but you can see how they're coming up. For You have the popliteal vein. Here's your long saphenous coming up from down here all the way up to your femoral here. You have your external iliac vein, internal, as we said. Pretty much they follow the arteries, but here you'll have your inferior vena cava. Here you'll have your superior vena cava. And the next one shows. Next one, please. Here's the saphenous vein. See how big it is? When you get varicose veins, it frequently swells tremendously, but they feel like they could get rid of this because there's so many other veins to take blood from the foot. So that they'll take a piece of vein, but you never take a piece of an artery. In the next one, and here it is coming all the way up into our femoral triangle here at the superior aspect of the thigh. In the next one, and these then are the tra traverses for the venous blood in the skull. We'd have the superior longitudinal sinus, the inferior longitudinal sinus, the straight sinus, the transverse sinus. See, they've taken out the tentorium cerebelli here. It's on the ridge, then it'll curve around in the a sigmoid sinus and go out through the jugular foramen. Just one more, I think. Next one. This shows the transverse sinus, as I showed you, with a coronal section. They call it either superior sagittal or superior longitudinal. But we'll learn more when we talk about cerebral spinal fluid coming back into this sinus. All right?